Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Debbie, for having me. Thank you, Dawson. Uh, I am a Homewood resident. I have my main office in Homewood, and so I've passed by this beautiful building many, many times, and it's nice to come in. It's a fantastic looking facility from the outside. I am originally from New Orleans. I came up to Birmingham for residency at UAB. After going to college in Atlanta, I went to medical school in Nashville, back to um, New Orleans for one year for internship, and then I came here. Wasn't sure if I was going to stay in Birmingham. Met my wife, who's from Alabama, and I've been here now for 16 years. So, and we're not going anywhere. Um, so I'm happy to be here. We got some excellent questions through the email from Debbie, and I tried to consolidate those questions as much as possible and also keep us on topic. Some of the bullet point questions could have been two or three hour lectures on their own. So we're going to touch on everything. I hope that everyone gets um, learns a little bit today. If you have any questions, we can save those to the end, and I'd be happy to, to stick around and and answer those um, for you. But I thought we'd get started by just kind of going over some of the things that I hope that we gain today. I want to answer your questions about the most pressing dermatologic issues that you may have. I want to give you a good basic understanding of what it takes to maintain healthy skin and to give you tools to optimi optimize the health of your skin. It doesn't really have to be that complicated. I think that's one thing that um, people get confused about and it's always good to have some guidance if you go to the drugstore while you can get some excellent products at the drugstore you know I went to the drugstore recently and just took a look I like to keep up on what's out there and it's overwhelming there's just so much and you have media marketing on the internet on television you know we're being marketed to every step of the way these days so it can be a lot of information so hopefully we can make some of that make sense for you today and then we also want to maybe dispel some common myths about the skin that may be held by you or others so one of the questions that I got was about oily skin and oily skin can be very problematic because it can lead to acne breakouts and it gives you that, you know, I like to call it a glow at this point. Um, I've learned to accept my glow. I have oily skin. Uh, but oily skin is, a, is actually a blessing because oily skin protects you from over drying which can protect you from wrinkling and premature aging. So while oily skin can cause breakouts, we can easily control those but it can also help you to look younger for longer. So it prevents wrinkles, but it can be more acne prone. Patients with oily skin typically have more um, larger pores. Think of the pores as outlets for oil. So every pore is affiliated, associated with a hair follicle, and every hair follicle is associated with an oil gland. So even if you don't have hair coming out of that follicle, there's the possibility for hair to come out of that follicle and sometimes the hairs are actually so fine and tiny and light that you don't even notice that they're there, but they're there. People with larger pores and oilier skin have larger oil glands as well. So that oil has to come out and it needs a larger opening. So that's why you see people with larger pores have oilier skin. You're going to get that visible shine throughout the day. Um, ladies have the advantage of putting a little powder on their foreheads if they're going to be in photos or their noses to keep it under control. I typically just take my sleeve and wipe it across my forehead. Um, and of course it's going to be worse when it's hot because sweat, while it keeps us cool, it can interfere with the normal function of the skin from a standpoint of um, acne control. On the flip, and, uh, sorry, I want to talk about some of these photos too just to make them make sense. So here we have um, a lovely lady but she has very oily skin. You can also see she has not a hint of a wrinkle. She's very young. Um, we have an example of large pores in this photo here. Of course, this is acne vulgaris, which is a very common problem that affects, I think, something like 56% of women who are over 35. A lot of people think that if they get out of their teenage years, they will never have to worry about, if they didn't have acne, then they're clear. But that's not the case. As long as you have hormones, you can have acne. And women toler deal with it much more than men do. And then up here, we have these little tiny red papules that we call sebaceous hyperplasia. Those are overactive oil glands. As you go through life, your skin gets a little bit thinner. Those oil glands have been working overtime for years, so they get larger. 
combination of large gland, thin skin, you're going to see those more, more prominently. They don't mean anything bad. They concern people sometimes. Sometimes they can look like basal cell carcinomas, which is the most common type of skin cancer. Actually, the most common type of cancer, period. So it's nice to make sure that they're nothing bad, but generally they're just a cosmetic nuisance that we can get rid of easily. So dry skin, total opposite. So patients with dry skin are going to not have as many acne breakouts, but that oil protects against allergens that can come in contact with the skin and cause problems with irritation. So these patients are going to be more prone to eczema or atopic dermatitis. They're going to wrinkle more easily. The pores are teeny tiny, small pores. So this is that porcelain skinned young lady who has excellent skin who never has an acne breakout, she's going to have to be a little more cautious when she gets older because oil production for everyone goes down as we age and we have to replenish that moisture in some sort of way. It can be easily irritated like we talked about and in the winter, chaos. Cold outside, drier temperatures and then when we come inside we like to pump heat into our environment to keep us comfortable with well, that dry heat makes the dryness even worse. So you're going to have more issues um, with eczema. You're going to have to think about the products that you use on your skin. If some of the cleansers are harsh, they're going to dry you out even more. If you're not applying the right moisturizer, then you can get into some trouble with um, some disorders that fit under the umbrella of eczema. This was a really good question too because we see a lot of patients that come in on medications who that can make them more sensitive to the sun. And sun sensitivity can cause a lot of issues. Obviously, more exposure to the sun can make you look older, but it can also make you more sensitive to developing precancers, which can turn into skin cancers. Um, it can be irritating, it can be dry. And some of the more common ones are oral contraceptives or birth control pills. That is going to include the implantable devices. It's going to include um, intrauterine devices as well. So anything that flux makes hormones, homo, hormones excuse me, fluctuate can cause this photosensitizing um, reaction. And that just means that the sun is going to interact with your skin in a more intense manner. Female hormones, some antiarthritic medications, some of the NSAIDs, some of the antipsychotic medications that are also used for things like seizures. Um, sorolins. Sorolins are mainly used by dermatologists, and that's an interesting one to include here. The point of those medicines is to make you more sensitive to the sun, and it's like, well, why would anybody want to be more sensitive to the sun? But certain skin conditions like psoriasis or um, some forms of skin lymphoma can be treated with a light that we have in our office. Now, it's not just broad, visible light. It's typically one narrow band of wavelength light that is known to be therapeutic for certain conditions. So when we're trying to um, enhance that effect, we will give a patient a sorolin that can be topical or it's something that they take by mouth. Um, but of course, that's always a fine balance. You want to do it in a way that's going to be therapeutic and not in a way that's going to cause another problem. Sulfa antibiotics. Um, Bactrim is a very common medication that a lot of people take for MRSA. Does anybody know what MRSA is? that bad kind of staff that you hear about on the news that used to have to go to a hospital and interact with really sick people. Now it's everywhere. So we use a lot of Bactrim. And those medicines, even if you take it for 10 to 14 days, it can make you more sensitive. Tetracyclines, that's going to include doxycycline, which is another common medication used for that MRSA. It's also one of the top medications that we use for acne. Oral anti-diabetics, anti so some of the glitazone medications can make you more sensitive to the sun, and then certain antidepressant medications. If I'm going too fast, please let me know. I'm trying to get everything in. I know we have limited time. I love to talk, though. So this is a man who has a very common reaction to hydrochlorothiazide, which is a, an anti-hypertensive medication. It's a calcium channel blocker that decreases, I'm sorry, it's a thiazide diuretic that decreases blood pressure. And in certain patients, it's the only thing that they can use that's really effective to keep their blood pressure under control. But when you go out into the sun, you can see here, the clue is really where the rash is. The, the, the distribution of the rash is the biggest clue. We call this a photo-distributed rash because everywhere that he would normally wear a shirt, 
you do not see the problem. And everywhere else where he is unprotected, we see this intense red scaly rash that's extremely irritating and very uncomfortable. This is a young lady who was on um, doxycycline for acne and went out to the beach, didn't apply her sunscreen, and as a result, it looks like a really bad sunburn, but it's actually a photosensitizing rash. And then this last one is a photo of melasma, which is another extremely common condition. It can affect men and women, but I think that it affects women in a ratio of somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to one to men. And it has to do with hormones. They call it the mask of pregnancy. And a lot of women, when they're pregnant, will develop this discoloration on their faces. It's completely harmless. It's a cosmetic problem, but it causes women great distress. However, just because it's called the mask of pregnancy, that's not the only time that you can see it. Some women get it with just the normal monthly fluctuations um, of hormones. Some women are going to see it when they're on other medications. So oral contraceptives can, do, can cause this problem as well. And there are lots of great options for keeping this under control. The main one is going to be a good moisturizer with a sunscreen that's used every single day. Acne and food. So I was a little reluctant to ta tackle this subject because this is a very controversial subject in the land of dermatology. For years and years, we have said that there is no relation to food. Acne has nothing to do with food. When I was a um, resident over at UAB, Bonnie Aluski, who is a past president of the American Academy of Dermatology, she's also known as the queen of dermatology, um, she used to tell patients that you can eat whatever you want as long as you don't rub it on your face. And that sounds like a personal, perfectly reasonable thing to say. However, more recent research has shown us that there are some foods that can't possibly contribute to development of acne. The main one is skim milk. And that seems kind of counterintuitive, right? But it's the proteins that they add to the skim milk to fortify it that are known to um, flare acne. I saw, I heard another story the other day on NPR about the benefits of whole milk and how those whole fats can actually help you to lose weight. Because your body, did you hear about that one? It kind of satisfies you so that you don't go on to eat other things. So we have to rethink the whole way that we think about milk. I thought that was interesting. The other category here is going to be um, foods with what they call a high glycemic index. Now, if you Google that, that's going to lead to a rabbit hole of different opinions. Um, a high glycemic index can be defined in many different ways, but I think that the easiest way to make it make sense is to think about foods that are white, foods that are starchy, and foods that we probably shouldn't be eating that much of anyway. Um, pretzels, bagels, these are just a few examples that I found to illustrate it. And then, of course, sugary sweet drinks. I can't find one benefit. I don't drink soda personally. I try to not let my kids drink soda, but my wife and I celebrated 10 years this weekend in New York, and my parents were here, and it was Sprite and Fanta all weekend. Um, but the sugary sweet sodas can also contribute to um, acne. And I think that one of the mechanisms behind how this works is these things can raise cortisol levels in our body, and when we have more cortisol running around in our system, it affects the hormones, produces more oil, clogs the pores, and then, then you have acne. So skim milk, foods with a high glycemic index, stress, just get rid of the stress, right? Um, stress can, can, fla can flare almost any inflammatory skin condition. So the importance of a balanced life with time to yourself, even if it's only 15 or 20 minutes, is really, really important and something that we stress to patients. We try to be holistic with our approach so that we can get them on a plan that will help them to control these things that we know that we cannot cure, which in dermatology is probably 85% of what we do. And then the last one is steroids. Steroids are, there, there, is, a, there is a diagnosis called steroid-induced acne. Patients who are on steroid inhalers for asthma, um, some of the young men who may use some of these steroids for anabolic steroids for weightlifting and muscle gain can see increases in acne as well. So we try to limit that as much as we can. Sometimes you can't because, you know, although we want your skin to look good, it's important that you continue to breathe.
So overview of acne, the causes of acne. This is another slide, and I just wanted to break it down a little bit further. Um, but oil production is a leading factor of acne. Dead skin cells or lack of exfoliation is another thing that can cause problems, leading to clogged pores. Think about that oil gland that's constantly producing oil with that outlet that's the pore, right? Let's go back to that. That oil gland's going to be working, but it has to have an outlet to let that stuff out. And if at any point in that system there's any cloggage or blocking, that's when you start to get acne bumps. And those turn into those infected acne pustules or zits. And that's what leads to the inflammation and the scarring. And so the whole thing starts with a clogged pore, really. And then bacteria. We have an, a bacteria on our skin that is a normal part of everybody's skin that has a role that we haven't quite figured out yet, but we know that it's implicated in acne, called propriani bacterium acnes. Exacerbating factors are makeup. You should wash your makeup off every single day. I recommend those makeup remover pads because they're quick and efficient and they don't cause a lot of irritation. And then you use your medicated cleanser if you have acne after that. If you're using your medicated cleanser to get your makeup off, it's not interacting with your skin the way we want it to and you're really kind of wasting your time. I always tell patients that a liquid makeup is, I'm sorry, a powder makeup is better than a liquid makeup is better than a cream makeup foundation because you just have the ability to clog your pores more with something that's heavier. And it's a slippery slope and a circle, a cycle that some ladies get into because, of course, their acne's bad, so they're self-conscious about it and they want to cover it up. So they get the thickest makeup possible to make it look like it's not there, but it's just making it worse. There are no brands in particular that I um, recommend for or against, but there is one. Studio Fix by MAC Cosmetics is the worst. It, well, it's great. It's great because ladies love it, but it's like one step away from stage makeup. So you love it because it's going to cover everything, but that's the reason why you shouldn't love it because it's going to cover and clog everything. Sorry, Chris. Um, if you're not having a problem, keep using it. Um, stress, again, is a risk factor. And then any greasy or oily substance. There's a big trend right now with coconut oil. You know, it was tea tree oil before that. It was black soap. It, it's, there's always something. Coconut oil, I, I can't imagine who came up with the theory of rubbing oil on your face, especially for young women. But here it is, and we have to deal with it. I hope that it, the fad dies quickly. Um, but anything that can potentially clog your pores is not going to be something that you want to use. The goal should be exfoliation and getting rid of the dead skin. And then occlusion, this goes back to the oiliness. You just don't want to plug it. A lot of patients, young girls, some boys will come in and we can't figure out why their acne is worse on one side of their face than the other. They say they're using all their medicines and then we figure it out. Anybody have any guesses as to what that might be? Cell phones. <laughs> the cell phones, which never ever leave the face. Actually, to text, they do leave the face a little bit more now. So, All right. So now we're going to run through some skin lesions that if you see, you should not be alarmed about. Um, these are all benign, and they're very, very common. The first one is the seborrheic keratosis. They are typically inherited. They um, appear in middle age, although I see them sometimes in people in their 20s. <coughs> Excuse me. They're very slow growing. They're extremely common. They may become irritated, and for that reason, the insurance companies do allow us to freeze these off, and it's covered a covered procedure. No treatment is really necessary because they don't have any real malignant potential. They really just sit on the surface of the skin. They don't go deep and they cannot spread. I like to call these birthday presents or wisdom spots. It goes over a lot better than saying age spots. Um, no treatment is necessary, like I said, but if we do treat them, we use liquid nitrogen. Has everyone, anyone ever had a wart frozen? Feels awesome, right? That's how we get rid of these most commonly. Um, but when they're irritated, sometimes that cold actually feels good, and then they just kind of peel off over several days. You keep it coated with an ointment, and it's really no big deal. The next one is a cherry angioma. These are bright red little vascular growths. I call them cousins to seborrheic keratoses because when you see them 
when you see seborrheic keratosis, you will often find cherry angiomas as well. They have no malignant potential at, at all. Sometimes they can appear in younger people as well. They slowly de increase in number and size over time. They have no malignant potential. They don't go deep into the skin. They're totally asymptomatic except when they bleed. And when they bleed, they can bleed a lot and they can be very difficult to control. So for that reason, we will treat them. I have some patients who just don't like them and they have learned that if they tell me they're irritated and I chart it, we can get rid of them and Blue Cross will pay for it too. A dermatofibroma, a lot of patients have these as well. They're very common on the arms and the legs. They are a focal area of dermal fibrosis. So think of it as a little well-organized scar. They come from bug bites, vaccinations, hair bumps, any sort of punctate irritation of the skin can cause these. We see them more commonly in patients who have lupus or HIV, but anybody can get them, and they're, they're very, very common. They do not have to be treated. If, they are, if, if, if treatment is, is, is requested, we would have to do something to cut them out because there is a deep component, and freezing it or burning it really won't get rid of the whole thing. It'll maybe take some off the top, but it, it will still be there. Okay, so we're going to move into the malignant lesions. These are the ones that you really need to be concerned about. These are the skin cancers. You will see that it may be difficult to discern between malignant and benign, and so we'll go over some tools that can help you. We recommend that everyone do a, a, a self-skin exam at home once a month. Um, it's easy to do it in the shower on the areas that you can look at. If you have a, a partner or a mate at home, you can have them look at your back. It's just a good idea because things come up really, really quickly. So the first one is an actinic keratosis. This is also called a solar keratosis or a precancer. And it is a precursor for squamous cell carcinoma, which is the second most common skin cancer and the second most concerning skin cancer. Squamous cell carcinomas can spread. We'll talk about those in a second. If they're left alone, and you can see it here in the photo, I'm sorry. I just assume everybody knows what this is. But it's just a very poorly, dis poorly circumscribed, scaly red papule or macule, flat or raised, that does not go away. And what happens is the, the base layer of the skin, those cells have transformed into non-normal cells, cells with malignant potential. So normally on our regular skin, we don't even notice it. Every day we bathe and we get rid of the stuff that kind of builds up on it. But this is abnormal, so it stays. You will see that you can make that crust go away. But in two or three weeks, it's going to come right back because it, it's not on a good foundation. So this has to be treated. And the most common form of treatment for it is liquid nitrogen, that freezing that we talked about. But there are many other options that we have for actinic keratosis these days. We can use chemical peeling agents. We can use a, um, a light treatment called blue light or red light or PDT. That's another question that we're going to talk about a little bit later. There are some topical options that you can use at home that are very aggressive and can make your skin look so terrible for a while that most patients don't want to use them, but it is an option. Um, they're going to be found mostly on sun-exposed skin. And while they're not in and of themselves inherited or genetic, your skin type is genetic. And certain skin types are going to be more likely to develop these because they just are more sensitive to the sun. So fair-skinned people, people with blue eyes, redheads, poor redheads, they get it all. Um, redheads are going to be very prone to these. And we recommend that our redheads come in like every three or four months and do some preventative things like blue light just to kind of keep them under control. They're going to feel rough or scaly. So when my patients come in, especially the guys, I always have to um, give a little bit of a caveat that I'm feeling around in their faces, not because I'm weird, but because you can feel these things better than you can see them. And you don't want to miss them. If you just look, you might not notice it. But when you start feeling, you can, you can definitely tell that they're there and you want to treat them. Because it's easier to treat them by freezing them than it is to have surgery and to have to be cut and possibly lose part of your ear. So basal cell carcinoma is the most common skin cancer. Up to 80% of all skin cancers are basal cell carcinomas. Has anyone in the room had a basal cell carcinoma? A lot of fun, right? Um, they are 
pearly looking. This is the most common type of basal cell. It's kind of this little round pearl, we call it, call it a pearly papule. And this one's good because it has that central dell in the middle where it's starting to ulcerate. But this is just one kind. This is the nodular type. It forms a nice little knot. They can also be superficial, where they just kind of spread and look like a rash. They can be sclerosing, where instead of being raised, they kind of go into the skin. Those are very um, difficult to treat because you have to make sure that you get all around it. And sometimes it's really hard to tell that when you're just looking. So many different forms of basal cell carcinoma. The superficial spreading type can be treated with a topical cream. Everything else really needs some sort of mechanical or surgical treatment. Um, as a rule, they do not spread, but they will cause lots of local destruction, so they have to be treated. Patients come in and we do the biopsy and they come back for surgery and they're like, oh doc, it's gone. It looks great. I'm like, yeah, that's what your eyes can see, but there are roots there and if you leave it alone, you come back in two years and half your nose is eaten. I'll never forget when I was a resident, we had a patient, I was on the surgery rotation at UAB with our Mohs surgeon. And this guy came in with something that looked very similar to this. It was a bio, you know, biopsy-proven basal cell. Well, Mo, Mohs um, Micrographic Surgery, M-O-H-S, Mohs, was developed by a doctor named Frederick Mohs many, many years ago. And it's a procedure that is done by dermatologists who've done an additional year of training where all they do is remove skin cancers on sensitive areas like the nose. Because when you come to see me, if we do it on your arm or your back, someplace that we have a lot of tissue, we're going to take a four millimeter margin around that, which is going to be what the Academy, American Academy of Dermatology and the American Cancer Society recommend for us to do to make sure that we have a 97% cure rate. And then we send it to the pathologist and you go home, we check it and then it's all fine. Well, when it's on your nose, you really don't want to take a four millimeter margin because that would be like half your nose. So you go to see a Mohs surgeon. What they do, the doctor, the surgeon serves as the pathologist as well. So they cut around it with a much smaller margin than we would use, usually one or two millimeters, which is like a tenth of a centimeter. And they make a little map and they go and check it right then. And if they see any skin cancer, they look at their map and they go and take another little one or two millimeters just in that area so that we're sparing tissue. So that we know when you leave, you know it's all gone and you also know that they've taken the least amount of tissue. So that's a little background on Mohs, right? So we're preparing this guy who comes in with a biopsy proven basal cell on his nose. No big deal. We've done it a thousand times. Maybe we'll take two layers. That's what we go and check, come back, take more, go and check and he's clear. When that guy left five hours later, he, half of his face was gone because underneath this basal cell had been tunneling. So there's all this normal skin, looks like everything is fine, but he could not get a clear margin. He had to keep going and going and going. And he was going to need major reconstructive surgery with um, a reconstructive surgeon at a later date. So what you see on the surface doesn't always tell the tale, but I like to use that story as an example of how it's important to get these things treated and not just, oh, it's gone. It looks fine. Most patients are fine after I tell that story. <laughs> All right, so squamous cell carcinoma, um, second most common non-melanoma skin cancer. You'll see this a lot in dermatology, non-melanoma skin cancer, because there's skin cancer and then there's melanoma. Melanoma just sort of has its own category, and we'll see why in a few minutes. It's locally invasive. So just like a basal cell, it's going to destroy the tissue where it is. It is um, able to metastasize, which means that it can spread to distant organs and cause trouble for you down the line, requiring radiation or chemotherapy. Uh, the fatality rate is pretty low on these because most people get them treated and they don't metastasize, but it's important to know that they can. Usually, we're going to see these again in the same population that we see actinic keratoses in because they develop a lot of times from actinic keratoses, or they can arise what we call de novo, out of nowhere. Excuse me. It's going to be usually on sun-exposed skin, and it can also occur in sites of chronic trauma so, or injury. So scars are more likely to develop skin cancer because that skin is, not, is no longer normal. So we have to watch our scars very carefully, which is one reason if you see a dermatologist, you'll notice that they will always check the area where you've had any skin cancers because A, even though the margin was clear, sometimes you never know, and then it's just scar tissue. So that one could have been totally gone, but that skin is a little different. 
Melanoma. Oh, no, all my melanoma stuff didn't put on. Okay, well, I don't need it. I'll just talk. So melanoma is the most deadly. I didn't leave it off on purpose. I'm sorry. It's the most deadly form of skin cancer. Melanoma cells are the pigment, melanoma, um, melanocytes, sorry, are the pigment producing cells in our skin. And everybody has pigment producing cells in their skin. Some are just larger, and that's why we have different skin tones. But when that goes awry, and when that turns malignant, they're very closely related to nerve cells. In fact, in development where we're embryos, melanocytes and nerve cells are the same. They come from the same origin. The nerve system, as you know, goes through your whole body. So melanocytes can travel quickly and easily, and that's why melanoma is, can be very bad news. You definitely want to get something like this checked out as soon as you see it. Now, we've seen something already in this talk that looked a whole lot like this, right? That seborrheic keratosis that I told you was absolutely nothing. But I bet if I would have put this one and the seborrheic keratosis up next to each other, half the room would have gotten it wrong because everybody would have been guessing. Um, there are some subtle features that we use that we also try to share with patients to use. And I use those every day in clinic, obviously, but sometimes there's just something about it that gives you the inclination that you need to check a little further. So this actually does not look to me like the other one just because it's not really on the skin. It's more in the skin. It's not sitting on top but it's sort of like a part of the skin. And then it just has, it has too many colors. It's too many colors, it's totally asymmetric. Um, this is something that I would biopsy all day long. But, you know, depending upon how long it was there, some people might miss something like this. So when you have a mole, you wanna make sure that you look at the A, B, C, D, E's of um, atypical moles. The first is the symmetry. If you can't, cut it down the middle on any given axis and have the exact same thing on both sides, then it's asymmetric. That is a sign, because that means that there's activity on one end that is not uniform and it's probably not good. The border. A regular mole is gonna have a border that is round and regular. This is not round and it's certainly not regular. We see little places where it juts out on each end. I think I'm losing my... Well, I have another one prepared. Old Boy Scout. All right. So you can see here where the um, border is just a little irregular and what I call smudgy. It's not quite the same, but it's not normal skin either. The color is another big clue. If you start seeing two and three colors, that's not really good. And then the diameter. So six millimeters is the guideline that we use. <coughs> Excuse me, that's about the diameter of a pencil eraser. Anything larger than that, if any of these others are positive, it needs to come off. And then evolving. So if you watch it over time, sometimes they may come in and it looks, this looks relatively normal. I mean, the border is not bad. I could make an argument for taking this off, but I could also make an argument for leaving this alone. Well, over time, this shows the progression, and that's why we like to take photos of any moles that we're concerned about at all, and every time you come in, we can go right back, we measure it, we have a photo, and pictures tell the tale. So if there's any changes, you know, we have a good clue as to whether or not we need to take action on that. Scars. Changing subjects. Um, Acne scarring, so acne is a medical condition. Sure, it leads to cosmetic issues and feelings of, um, you know, it, it makes people feel bad about themselves and affects self-esteem, but at its heart, it's a medical condition. And one of the main reasons that it needs to be treated, but aside from the um, cosmetic effect, is the fact that it can leave significant scarring. This is a young lady who has been a patient of mine for probably eight years, she's had two rounds of Accutane, which is the only known cure for acne, and had a great result after the second round. She no longer had any breakouts, but she had all this scarring. And traditionally, this would have been a very difficult problem to correct for her, but luckily now we have a laser that can resurface the skin in a way that is not going to put her under a rock for three weeks because her skin is weepy and she can't go out and at risk of infection. It does it more gradually and more slowly and the downtime is very minimal. We use that um, same laser for wrinkling, for pigmentation, for thick 
traumatic scars, it does great. Uh, but after four treatments, you can see that she had a really good result that she was very happy with. Her skin texture has been restored almost back to normal. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's, it's pretty good. So that's the preferred method. Of course, that's going to be a little bit more expensive and require a little bit more of a time investment. Um, but we also have a, a, a pen called a derm roller. And it's a pretty primitive sort of procedure, but it works pretty well uh, um, if, you, if you can't afford Fraxel. It's basically um, a pen that is either motorized by electricity or battery. And on the end of it is a wheel that has little spikes. Sounds fun, right? So we numb the skin, and it takes a very motivated patient. And then you just go over and over and over the skin, and you want little pinpoints of bleeding. And what that does is stimulates collagen deeper in the skin to remodel so that that scarring is not as apparent. Subcision is another version of that, and this is used for more discreet scars. Subcision wouldn't have been a really good option for her, but some patients come in who've had maybe chicken pox and just have a few, um, or they had maybe a biopsy or something on their skin that just left a divot, a larger divot, a boxcar scar, we call those. Subcision is where we numb that area up, another very primitive procedure. Take a needle and just release those adhesions that are, that's holding that skin down to make it depressed. So you kind of just go back and forth. You're numb. Uh, the result is really pretty good. I mean, it's a very cheap procedure. All it takes is a needle and some numbing. Uh, and you have to do it several times. You kind of want to get a bleb of blood under that area, and that helps to lift the skin and to provide the nutrients that that skin needs to, um, to heal in a better way. And then chemical peels are an, uh, another excellent option for not only acne control, but for the scarring and the discoloration that the acne can leave behind. It's going to be more of a series, and of course we have different peeling agents depending upon what your goals are. It can help with discoloration, it can help with acne scarring, wrinkles, a bunch of different things. Sorry, I'm playing with two different ones now. Okay. Traumatic scars. So this is another example of a lady who had a scar from an accident on her leg. You can see discoloration. You can also see where the scar is indented. Uh, and she had two treatments with the Fraxel. She probably could have had another one to knock out the rest of the pigment, but she was happy after this. This takes about 10 minutes. You have to numb for about an hour, but after a few treatments, 10 minutes is how long it takes to actually do the procedure. I think it's a pretty good result. So skincare products, big topic. Let's try to break it down, make it make sense. The most important thing is always gonna be sunscreen, <laughs> period. The sun is a wonderful gift from God, but it can do a lot of things that we don't necessarily want it to do. Some of we talked about before. Sunscreen can shield against harmful UV rays. UV rays, exposure to UV rays, either intermittently at high levels or over time can lead to skin cancer and premature aging, wrinkling, discoloration. This is a great photo because this is a lady who drove a truck and never wore sunscreen, drove a truck for years. So obviously the left side, you can see here, sorry, is extremely more photo damaged than the right side. If anybody ever has any doubts about what the sun can do, voila. <laughs> Lower skin cancer risk, um, sunscreen, it reduces blotchiness, discoloration, uneven pigment, and it also helps prevent sunburns. Um, I, th I think that the biggest impediment to using sunscreen for most people is finding the right product because it's very, um, there's, a, just, there's just a lot out there. And they can smell like the beach, they can make you look chalky, they can make your skin oily, you know. They, they, you can always find a reason to not wear a sunscreen. I think once you find the right one, and you don't mind wearing it, and it just becomes a part of your everyday habit, you're gonna do yourself a big favor. So it's worth it to talk to an esthetician or a dermatologist and try to find a good sunscreen that you don't mind um, wearing every day. There are two main types of sunscreen. We'll just touch on this briefly. There are chemical sunscreens and there are physical sunscreens. The chemical sunscreens have n names like cinemates and paba and paraben, and they form a reaction in the skin that makes the sun not have as much of an effect as um, it would if you didn't have the sunscreen on. The physical blockers, that's really what we prefer. They are minerals, so zinc or titanium. Anybody remember the... Um, What's the, the, the Mickey Mouse show, Annette Funicello, what do they call them? The Mouseketeers. Mus yeah, Mouseketeers, right? And they, the surfers used to wear that thick, chalky stuff. 
that was zinc oxide. Luckily, it's been refined and the products are a lot more elegant now where they can make those particles much smaller and you can wear it every day and not look like a clown. Um, and that's what you want because those just reflect the light of the sun and you cannot be allergic to them like you can be allergic to the chemicals. 25% of all people are going to be allergic to a chemical sunscreen. So when you're going in the drugstore, you're just playing Russian roulette. Two good ones over the counter that I like a lot are by Neutrogena. It's the baby and the pure, and they're actually the same thing, but because of marketing, you know, they have to create two different products. But they have both zinc and titanium, and if you use them and don't apply too much, you um, can not get that ashy, chalky look. There's another line I love. It's a, a line called Elta MD, and it's um, only available at doctor's offices, but it's very elegant. They have perfected the art of transparent physical sunscreens. And they have one for oily skin, acne prone skin, rosacea skin, dry skin. They have one with the tint. They have one for everybody. That's a really good option as well. And they're not very expensive. So after um, sunscreen, the one thing that I request that everyone go on is a retinoid. Because a retinoid is going to get you, it's going to always tell patients, if you use this in 10 years, you're going to be the youngest looking one in your group of friends because it's going to help to increase cell turnover. It's going to help your skin cells to continue to exfoliate in a very minor way. It's almost like giving yourself a mini chemical peel every single day. So the first four to six weeks can be a little rough, but with good instruction, you can get over that hump. This is the reason why a lot of people don't use these because they either pick up something that they don't get any guidance on or whatever and they try it and it causes them to be red and scaly this is my favorite call back to the office because i tell the patient the nurse tells the patient we give the patient a handout and people still call because when it happens to you it's different um, but if you can get through that first four to six weeks i promise the results are worth it inhibits pigment from producing um it inhibits pigment producing cells so the cells in your skin that produce pigment or make dark spots it's going to inhibit that process it reduces fine lines and wrinkles it remodels the collagen it can help with scarring it helps it's like a miracle cream right and the reason most people don't use it is either they don't know about it or they get afraid of it because they think that they have an allergy there are two forms there are the retinols those are the ones that are over the counter that's what you're going to see in rock and what you're going to see in L'Oreal products. And then you have the retinoids. That is the um, acid form. That is prescription. And they are sold and marketed for two main reasons. Acne control and wrinkling. And I always say if you have a little bit of acne, let's find it. Because the insurance company will pay for that, but they won't pay for wrinkles. And it's the same cream. Growth factors. Um, Skin Medica is the company that kind of came up with growth factor technology and growth factors were developed to help your skin to regenerate in a more organized manner and they do wonders for areas that are prone to wrinkling and can be very thin and develop that crepiness that nobody really likes. There are some others that have come out since then. Um, this is my, my new favorite. It's a little, I'm oh, sorry, it's a little bit cheaper and it doesn't have the smell. This is a great product, but um, we call it, uh, a lot of ladies in the office call it husband be gone because it smells horrible <laughs> and you put it on at night. <laughs> uh, but it's a workhorse for skin repair. They reduce hyperpigmentation. They help enhance elasticity, which is always a good thing. We want that good bounce back skin. It reduces fine lines and wrinkles and it helps to repair wounds as well. The next major category is antioxidants. Antioxidants are your vitamin C, your vitamin E. They help with pigment as well. So in your skin, there are these things called free radicals. And when the free radicals are stimulated by the sun, it's like little Pac-Man just munching away at your collagen. And when your collagen starts to go away, that's when you start to develop wrinkles. So antioxidants scavenge those free radicals and stop them from having that effect on your skin. Reduces age spots um, and again, increases collagen production. All right, we're gonna jump right into wrinkle relaxers. I'm gonna go through these quickly. Um, just to give you an overview, but wrinkle relaxers, the more common name for this is botulinum or the brand name is Botox. It's like Kleenex. People use that for tissue, but there are other products that can achieve the same thing, namely Dysport and Xeomin. But in your muscles, they're controlled by nerves. 
And when those muscles work overtime, like any other muscle, if I go to the gym and I work this muscle, this muscle is going to get big. And the definition between the muscles is going to be more apparent. And that is a great thing for the arms and the abs. But on your face, it's not so good. Because that definition, we call those wrinkles. And we want to make those less apparent. So how Botox works, or botulinum works, is it stops this reaction that the nerve gives to the muscle to make it fire. So before Botox, this stuff called acetylcholine can go to that muscle and make it fire. So it kind of relaxes the muscle. After Botox, it blocks that signal and reduces the contraction. So we like to say it relaxes it. You can do it in a way that will still maintain a normal appearance, although everybody doesn't do that. You can have that look where nobody really knows. Um, and if you do it over time, just like any other muscle, it's not gonna be as active, so those lines will eventually sort of treat themselves. And you either will require less Botox for treatment or you will not have to go back quite as frequently for the treatment. And these are a couple of examples of before and afters um, of a lady who had Botox around the eyes. When she, I tell patients all the time, we can make an argument for expression in the forehead and here in the glabella. We call that the 11s. You can't tell because I have low Botox. But um, when, when you're talking about the eyes, that's not expression. That's just age. And in your photos, you really want that to go away if, if, you, if you're interested in getting rid of it. Another one on the forehead, this is a good example of a lady who might have waited a little too late. And now some of these lines are starting to be what we call etched in. They're there even when she's not moving. More difficult to get rid of, but the earlier you start, the more you can prevent that. And then dermal fillers. So a lot of patients come in and they have questions and everything is Botox, right? And they, they're really talking about volume loss or um, enhancing cheeks or something like that. Botox just relaxes muscles. If you're talking about volume loss for the parentheses or for jowling here or for um, loss of uh, volume in the middle of the face, you have to go in and replace that volume. And so we inject a product like... Juvederm or Restylane or something like that. It replaces the volume at various levels in the skin. It can smooth lines and provide lift. So fine lines require one type of filler. Wrinkles require something different. And the big folds are going to require a heavier, more robust product. So luckily, we have many different things at our disposal that can achieve all these different objectives. Uh, this is a lady who had one of the heavier products. You can see where she has some volume loss here. And the, the volume loss always starts up. As we age, not only do we lose collagen, but we also lose bone. Our skeletal bone that holds everything up, the framework, just starts to eat, eat away at itself. And so you don't have that nice framework holding everything up. You also lose the normal fat pads. Babies are really cute because they have nothing but fat in their faces. Um, but, you know, she started to experience just some of that normal aging, some volume loss here, volume loss here. It's kind of making everything go down. Um, she had a little product placed under the muscle here, a little placed here, and then just a little bit here. Still looks natural. It's a nice result. She looks like herself. She doesn't look like a different person. You know, she doesn't look like Joan Rivers or somebody who went too far. And that's always the goal. My, the goal to me is to have your friends just look at you and say, you look really good. You look, you look refreshed. If somebody can look across the room and say, I like your cheeks, that's not, that's not what really we're going for, you know? This is another lady, a um, little bit younger. We use a different product that's better for fine lines. She has a lot of lines around her mouth. Um, and when you smooth those out, you can just create a better, more youthful appearing mouth area. You can see that the corners of her mouth are no longer turning down. We didn't enhance her lips. She didn't want a bigger lip. She just wanted to look younger around the mouth. And that was a, a, a good way to achieve that, I thought. And then Sculptra is a different filler. It's for the person who really does not want it to be obvious at all. This is one that I like for ladies who have like crepey skin, where you just kind of have to lift everywhere. The beauty of Sculptra is it's a liquid. It's not a gel or a paste, so you can use it anywhere it's going to be more gradual. So you have to do three treatments, you do it every six weeks, and then it lasts for two years, but it's more of a gradual improvement. It's not for the person who's, you know, has a party in three weeks and they want to look refreshed. 
Tybella is the new kid on the block. This is, you may see some marketing about this because they've been talking about it for about 10 years. And Kybella is specifically for the submental fullness, that turkey neck or fat under the chin. Fabulous. This is a lady who had, um, this was after only eight weeks and we see the maximum results after 12 weeks, but I was so excited I wanted to show. She just, you know, the profile. She's not overweight. She's not going to lose any more weight. And even if she does, this is not going to go away. This is genetic. It has nothing to do with weight gain. It's um, an injection that you, we, we draw on your skin and then we put this little stencil that tells us where we need to go. We inject this product in that kills fat on contact. You're like, well, why don't they use it everywhere, right? Well, I think they're looking into it, but when they did the marketing, there was nothing for this area at the time. So it's taken off really well just because it's a good option. Photodynamic therapy. So somebody had a question about blue light versus red light. And this is the treatment that I mentioned earlier that's good for preventing precancers. And not only can it get rid of precancers that we see, I like this one because where there's smoke, there's fire. And if you see, if, if a, especially my older gentlemen who have you know, lost some of their natural protection at the top and don't like to wear hats, that's an area that's constantly beaten by the sun. So if you are freezing 10 AKs, actinic keratosis up there, 10 precancers, there's probably more in that normal tissue. So we want to treat the whole field. And how this works there is a substance that we put on the skin that makes it more sensitive to this special light that you sit under afterward. We apply it. Depending upon the area, it can sit for an hour or two, and then we have you sit under the blue light. That's where it gets its name. The light and the levulonic acid, which is a substance, have this reaction that can go and um, destroy those cells that have started that process of going down the road of precancer. And this is a gentleman who had a lot of precancers. He's kind of a typical Alabama, you know, farmer, been out a lot, former redhead, just a lot of precancers. And here, after two treatments, we do it once and then we repeat it in eight weeks. You do the light for 16 minutes only. The first six minutes feel awful. For about three or four days after that, you have some redness and some scaling, but you can achieve this, which is, it also helps with some of the brown spots, which aren't even really a problem. All right, um, I think I'm over time, but hopefully we can finish up these last few questions. Is that, is that okay with everybody? Okay. So these were just some other questions that didn't really fit in anywhere, and I thought I'd just answer them really quickly. How often should you should makeup brushes be washed? How often should they be replaced? So if you're using it for, to apply your foundation, you probably need to wash those every two weeks. After about six months, you probably need to replace your brushes. And if the makeup is really, really um, making the brushes um, behave in a way that they are not nice and fluffy anymore, you can drop some mineral oil to kind of break that stuff up, and then the soap and water gets in there and really washes them well. How often should we exfoliate our skin and what's the best way to do it? Well, one way we already talked about, the retinoid, that's my favorite way because not only do you exfoliate, but you get all those other benefits, oil control, prevention of acne, prevention of precancers, pigmentation, all that stuff from a retinoid. You can also do microderm abrasion, which is a procedure we do in the office where we sort of like vacuum all the stuff out of your pores. It gets rid of all that environmental debris that's kind of sitting on your skin. There's zero downtime with it, and it makes your... Um, products and your um, medications absorb better into your skin. So it's really a lunchtime procedure. You can also use those scrubs with the little spherical particles. They were in the news a little bit last year because they were trying to ban them for a while. I think some of them were that if they weren't like plastic, then they were possibly causing cancer. I, don't, I think that went nowhere. But I like the spherical particles because they're perfectly round and when you scrub, you're not going to be doing more damage. If they're not perfectly spherical, if you're too aggressive, you can actually do more damage than you, than you intend to. You don't want to do that more than every week. Uh, what's the best way to eliminate under eye darkness? If I could cure this in cellulite, you would, you would not see me here. Um, under eye darkness is tricky because it can be caused by many different things. So if you have allergies, you want to control the allergies. Um, you want to make sure you get at least eight hours of sleep. You want to make sure you drink a lot of water. All those things can contribute to problems around the eyes. Eyelid skin is different. There are no oil glands and it's very, very thin. And there are very complicated vessels running in this area and they're sitting right below the skin. So if they're irritated at all by constant 
you know, rubbing the eyes from allergies or itchiness, it can make those vessels break. And the deposits from the vessels are, blood, blood is nothing but iron. So those iron deposits called hemocytorin can sit in the skin and that's when you get kind of like that bluish darkness, that bluish purple kind of ill-defined darkness. You can also get pigment darkness if you rub a lot. So you want to treat those differently. There's some good eye creams that can attack the hemocytorin and then I use more of like fading creams if it's true darkness. What's the best way to minimize pores? There's not really a great way. My favorite way is to use the retinoid because it's going to control the oil. And if the apparatus that's making the pore large in general is controlled, then you don't have to, um, you're not going to release as much oil and the pore can kind of relax. So retinoids are awesome. Another benefit of retinoids, microdermabrasion can achieve that as well. And then resurfacing lasers can do it, but I think it's kind of overboard. Are there uh, preventative meds for psoriasis or just treatment? We didn't talk about psoriasis at all, but it's a very important condition. It affects a lot of people. It can affect the joints, the skin. It can have relations to other problems like diabetes and obesity. There is no cure for psoriasis, but I always tell patients this is the best time to have psoriasis. I'm sure most of you have seen commercials. Every six months, there's a new medication for psoriasis. There's a class of medicines called biologics that help control the immune system on the inside, and that has made a world of difference in the treatment of psoriasis. So Embro, Humira, some of the ones you're gonna see now, one of the, the newest one is called Tults. There's one called Cosentix, Otesla. I know you've seen that commercial because I can't turn on the television without seeing it. So all these treatments are things that you would have to maintain, but if you've had psoriasis on your skin for many, many years, <laughs> trust me, taking a pill or doing an injection every week or every month is a small step toward being able to have that confidence that you need to go out and earn a living or have a, a close interpersonal relationship. Um, it really affects people's self-esteem. So this is giving them the freedom to go out and just live and not have to think about their skin all the time. And that's it. We've gotten to the end, not too far over time. Um, I want to thank you all for having me. Um, these are my two kids, Grant and Helen, six and four, um, and they are just the light of our lives. So thank you for having me.